like to welcome Ms. Monique Bookstein. She is the Ombudsman for Prince William County Public Schools. Please help me in welcoming her as she presents for you tonight. Thank you, Nanette. I appreciate this opportunity to speak before everyone. So as we get started here, let me just make sure that... Uh, and I cannot see, but are you guys able to see my screen, Yannette, if you can let me know? Is it sharing? No, not yet. It's not yet? No. Okay. Okay. Yep, I see, see it. Now? Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Well, again, thank you, Yunette, and welcome everyone for joining me here tonight. As uh, Yunette mentioned, my name is Monique Bookstein, and I currently serve as Prince William County Schools Ombudsman. I'm very thankful to have this opportunity to speak before you and highlight my role within PWCS. Uh, first off, I want to talk a little bit about myself and explain um, kind of who I am and how I came here to Prince William County Schools. So I've been an ombudsman for the last 15 years. And before joining PWCS, I was an ombudsman in the federal government. Um, while in that position, I was considered internal facing, um, which meant that I only worked with employees. Um, joining PWCS, um, the charge became a little bit larger. I work um, with staff, but I also work with parents, students, and community members who may have issues or concerns about PWCS matters. Um, my hope today is that by the end of the presentation, you'll have a better understanding of my role and when to consult the office if needed. I do want to point this out that today I will not be talking about individual concerns due to the confidential nature of my office. Um, if you do have a concern that you would like to raise to my attention, I'm more than happy to discuss that with you. We can do that separately. And at the end, I'll highlight how you can go about reaching me. So I want to talk a little bit about the agenda for tonight. Um, first off, I want to, I'll talk about what is an ombudsman. So the name does not denote the work that I do. I often tell individuals if I was an AC repairman and your AC broke down, you would understand what my role is. Um, ombudsman, unfortunately, does not denote everything that I do. So hopefully um, today I'll take some time to go through that and you'll gain that understanding. Um, next, I'll talk about how does the organization work with an ombudsman. And my role here is twofold. I work with the individual who contacts me, but I also work with the organization. So I'll show you how both of these work. Uh, next, we'll talk about what services I provide. Um, as I mentioned, I've been doing this um, role for quite some time. Um, there are a variety of services in which I can provide. So we'll discuss some of those today. And then we'll talk about what type of concerns are raised to the ombudsman's office. And so some of those are always um, unique concerns to the individual. I at times can see patterns in those concerns. Uh, again, I will mark that in 15 years, I continue to see new uh, issues brought to my office. So we'll talk about some of the common ones that I have seen today. And then finally, when you should you contact the ombudsman's office? Um, we'll talk about when it is best to reach out to me. I often will say anytime during the conflict, but we'll highlight the process on how to do that. And then hopefully again, you'll gain that understanding of when and if you want to reach out to the office. So what is an ombudsman? Uh, there are a number of different titles or names for the position. There's ombuds, there's organizational ombuds, there's ombudsmen, there's ombudsperson, and there's many more. Again, all of these names are synonymous, but an organizational ombudsman will work in all types of organizations. You can find them in government agencies, college and universities, 
corporations, hospitals, other healthcare organizations, not-for-profit organizations, foundations, associations. An organizational ombuds operates in a manner to preserve the confidentiality of those seeking services, maintains a neutral, impartial position with respect to the concerns raised, works with an organizational system at the informal level compared to formal channels that are available and is independent from any organizational structure. Organizational ombuds, such as myself, have their own standards of practice and code of ethics that guides their work. This was established by the International Ombuds Association. While the position here at PWCS was it established by the school board, they have enacted a policy, which is policy 180, that specifically states, the purpose of the Office of the Ombudsman within PWCS is to provide parents, students, and members of the school community with access to an independent, impartial individual who can facilitate informal resolution of concerns, conflicts, and problematic issues arising within PWCS, and who is authorized to bring systemic organizational concerns to the attention of the school board and division superintendent. And as I note there, it's an unusual name, but it is an important service. The International Ombuds Association, or IOA, is a member-led professional association committed to supporting ombuds worldwide. Formed in 2005, the IOA is one of the largest international associations of professional ombuds practitioners in the world, representing more than 1,100 members across the globe. It focuses on the standards of practice and code of ethics. Right now, what I'd like to do is just play a short video from the association highlighting the role. For more than 200 years, organizational ombuds have been providing confidential, neutral, informal, and independent guidance to people and organizations worldwide. In an era increasingly defined by conflict and accelerated change, ombuds have an important service to offer. Who are ombuds? They are trusted advisors engaged by people and organizations to inform critical decisions for a lasting positive impact. An ombud serves as a safe, off-the-record resource for employees, students, faculty, managers, executives, and other stakeholders seeking ways to identify and address workplace issues and other concerns. They use their unique skill set to help people develop options for addressing these issues, separate from, but often complementing, the work of HR, legal, and compliance. Ombuds today understand that addressing a difficult issue is often the crucible in which individuals and organizations must pass before fairness, positive change, progress can be achieved. The modern ombuds empowers individuals to work through conflicts and concerns and helps organizations examine risks, strengthen culture, hone responses, and address issues that stand in the way of achieving their goals. To that end, ombuds facilitate a journey beyond the issue or conflict. Those they serve emerge transformed, empowered, and prepared to reach their full potential. For any organization in need of a trusted resource to help navigate today's complex social and work environment, the modern ombuds is a transformative force toward more ethical, engaged, fair, and empowered organizations and communities around the world. To find out more about the value of the modern ombuds, please visit us at www.ombudsassociation.org. So that's just a glimpse from the association as to what the role does. I do want to note that the use of the ombudsman role within the K through 12 environment is fairly new. Uh, there's around uh, over 19,000 school districts throughout the U.S. 
And from that, there's about um, 40 districts that have ombudsmen. So it is a very small role in the environment, the K through 12 environment. And so I am pleased to be a part of that. There are four fundamental principles, and I spoke a little bit about them earlier, but I'd like to go into them now in regard to an ombudsman's office. First off, there's confidentiality, and then there's informality, independence, impartiality, or neutrality. So my plan for now is to talk about each of the standards of practice in regard to these principles so you can understand what it means when you contact the office. So for the first principle, confidentiality, the standards of practice involve the fact that any communication with me is kept confidential. The only time that I would disclose that information is if I do feel that there is a imminent risk of harm to yourself or to another. So I talk with visitors and explain that this is a safe place to talk things through. I am considered, because of the laws in Virginia, a mandated reporter. So if that is a situation that is raised to my attention, I do advise the individual that I would have to break confidentiality and report it. So again, the only times that I would ever break that is if it is in regard to being a mandated reporter or if I thought there was a risk of harm. I will never disclose information unless I have your per express permission. A lot of times individuals contact my office and they just wanna discuss what their options are or how to move forward. And so at that time, if there's nothing that I can do other than have the conversation with them, then that may be it. But if I do have to look into something or talk to someone about a particular situation, we talk all of that through before I do anything. I kind of equate it to the person in the car driving. I'm the GPS. I point out things as we go along, but you're in charge of this. So again, if you share something with me and you say, Mo, all I want is to have this type of information brought to someone's attention, but I don't want this information then we talk all of that through. Again, I may share some trends in regard to the feedback I get based upon the issues that come to my office, but I do take confidentiality seriously. When we talk later about the informality of my office and records, I do not maintain records. If someone is talking to me, I may take notes in regard to the situations just so I can help strategize as I'm talking about options. But after someone leaves my office, all of that information is destroyed. The next principle is informality. And so the standards of practice with that are, as I mentioned earlier, I am an off the record resource. Uh, individuals choose to come and see me. It's not mandatory that you come and utilize the ombudsman's office. I will not make decisions for you. This is your choice on how you move forward with this. And again, consulting my office is not a part of any formalized process. That's certainly an avenue for you. Um, there's many avenues in which you can reach out within the organization. Um, again, I would say being a voluntary resource, you're welcome to come and talk to me, even if you don't know where to go. Um, that's one of the things that which I do is help point out options for individuals, especially for parents. I am not considered notice to the organization. So what that means is that many times there are situations where they can say, an individual could say, I've put on notice the organization because I spoke to the ombudsman's office. That's not the case here. Speaking to an ombudsman, again, is an informal voluntary resource. So again, I am not considered notice to the organization. And also, as I mentioned, there are no permanent records. I do maintain data, and the data that I maintain, we'll talk about that in a little bit, is very um, generic type of information. How many people contact my office, um, difference between parents versus employees, and things of that nature. Again, it's only statistical data, and it is not information regarding the visitor. The next principle is independence. And so 
The standards of practice for that means is that I operate independently without influence. I sit outside any chain of command. I do report to the school board and the superintendent, but I do so to give them systemic feedback and trends that I see affecting the entire organization as a whole. I do not hold any other position within the organization other than my role as ombudsman. I'm able to select my own staff and maintain my own budget. And I also have sole discretion on how or when to engage in any matter. Individuals who do contact the office, I do have access to information within the organization and can look at that as necessary. The final principle is impartiality or neutrality. So the standards of practice with that is that I cannot be your advocate, nor do I advocate for the school system. What I do advocate for is a fair and equitable process for everyone. So I have no personal interest in the outcome of the matter. I do work with you to help identify options that I see that could be used to resolve the situation or help you move forward. But again, I'm that unbiased resource. Many times I have individuals who come to me and say, it was, ha it was a good opportunity to talk to the ombudsman because what I did was I come at from a different perspective, meaning a significant other, a peer, a coworker, another parent, they're going to have their own biases with that. My part is to be that unbiased resource for you, to point out things, to look at it from all angles so that we can talk about what are the possible solutions for it. So talking a little bit of history in regard to the position, the position, as I mentioned, is fairly new within PWCS. It was established by the school board in 2019, and the first ombudsman was hired that year, along with the ombudsman assistant. And in this case, um, that's my assistant is Rosa Maria Menzinez, and um, she ha it has been with the office since it was created in 2019. I joined the office in January of 2022. So um, uh, in a month, it marks my two year anniversary here with PWCS. Um, as you can see um, from the first year of annual reporting, we had 158 visitors and we've had a steady increase into last year, we had our highest number to date, which was 298 visitors. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about what it's like when you're working with the ombudsman. So visitors are often sure when to contact the office or what to expect when they do. So what this slide highlights is how I go about my process. So initially there'll be the initial conversation between myself and the visitor. And this conversation can be in person, over phone or via Zoom. Um, there's also a misperception of what my role is. So the next step, which is clarifying that, is I work with the visitor and I discuss what my role is in the organization and what I can and cannot do. Next, I'll work to understand the situation from the visitor's perspective. Generally, I do this by listening to what they're um, discussing, asking clarifying questions that helps with my analysis of the situation. And um, Next, we'll move into exploring what the options I see. Again, I do um, identify options. Um, when folks come to me, I make it clear that these are just options. You are driving it. If you choose not to do anything, that's fine. Um, I'm just presenting what I see could help um, rectify what you're going through. Again, there's no committing to doing anything other than just talking to me. So as we discuss this options, we'll discuss the next steps, some of which could include me and some may not. Next, I'd like to highlight for you what I cannot do. First, I cannot make decisions. This is your journey and your choice on how you want to move forward with it. I cannot serve as your advocate. This is something that a lot of times visitors come to me expecting that I can rectify the situation and address it how they would see fit. 
Again, I cannot advocate for anyone who comes to my office, nor can I advocate for the school system. I'm advocating for a fair and equitable process. I cannot provide legal advice. I cannot make or change policy. For example, I've had parents come to me and maybe their child has been suspended. I cannot change that action. I might also have a parent who wants to have a bully addressed. I cannot mandate that something happens with that. And then finally, I cannot conduct formal investigations. As I mentioned, one of my principles is the fact that I am an informal resource. That's the part in which conducting a formal investigation is not part of my role. Throughout the year, I provide quarterly and an annual report to PWCS. Last month, I had the opportunity to present my annual report for the 2022-2023 school year to the school board. And I'd like to take the next few minutes to kind of go through some of the um, findings from that report, especially the data with that. So as you see here, I had a total of 298 visitors. 78% or 233 were employees of PWCS. 19% or 65 were, excuse me, or 55 were parents or guardians, and then 10 or 3% were community members. So as you can tell from the uh, graphic, um, generally it's about an 80% high on the employee side, 20% on parents and community members. What you see here are, um, what's known as the IOA identifies nine specific categories for a, an ombudsman to identify what types of issues come through their office. And if I'm able to do this correctly, are you able to see the screen? Yes, yes we are. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. So um, the uniform reporting categories, and I'm going to quickly kind of go through them, but I did want to highlight these for you. Um, each category um, that you see listed on the uh, prior screen is a specific issues that are in regarding to the cases that come through my office. So when I work with a visitor, um, I identify after we meet what was the issue. Um, it may be a variety of issues. Um, for example, you can see here um, the category one deals with compensation and benefits. Category two is the evaluative relationship, which is that between the employee and the supervisor. Category three is peer and colleagues. Category four would deal with career progression and development. So several of these are employee related. Um, the next uh, category five deals with legal, regulatory, financial, and compliance. Category six deals with safety, health, physical environment. Category seven deals with services and administrative issues. And I'll talk in a minute that this is generally where I see the issues fall for parents and community members who reach my office. And as you can see with all of these categories, they have a number of subcategories within it. So within this one, it could be, for example, um, the quality of services, the responsiveness of the services. So these are which when individuals talk to me, I identify where I am seeing the issues that they've presented for me. Category eight is organizational strategic and mission related. So that relates to the organization as a whole. A number of parents and community concerns are listed in that category. And then finally, value ethics and standards of the organization. And again, a number of um, parent and community concerns are listed in that category. So going back to this slide, and again, if you can please just confirm that you can see it. Yes, we can. Okay, great. 
Uh, so as you can see, this this denotes um, the last four years worth of data for the office. And um, this is a combination of all of the visitors who have come to the office. So as you can see, the highest category generally is the evaluative relationship. That makes sense if 78% of what I'm seeing um, generally is employees. So that is the highest category. The second one is services and administrative issues. And again, that would make sense because in part that is my parents and um, community members. And then the second one would be organizational, strategic, and mission related. And again, making sense because that includes um, both employees and um, parents and community members. So now what I'd like to do is just to highlight um, for this last, the 2022, 2023 school year, um, as you can see from this chart, um, basically of the um, number of visitors that I had who contacted the office, 77% fell in that category. So the highest category and the highest subcategory for this were administrative decisions and the interpretation or application of rules, which denotes decision made on matters and the behavior of the service provider, which would be the school system. And so that denotes what, how the parent was dealt with by the school division. I am also including community members here. And again, their um, highest category fell within that services and administrative issues. Again, making sense that that's where that would fall. And they equally had the same highest subcategories, which were administrative decisions and application of rules, as well as the behavior of the service provider. I wanted to highlight for you this slide, which is the contacts um, made to my office and um, by school level. So um, the slide here does denote that the issues raised by parents and guardians and community were raised in regard to this level. Uh, if uh, anyone on um, this presentation did watch my school board presentation, or if you've looked at the annual report, I also did this slide for employees. Um, just to highlight that for you, um, the employee side doesn't necessarily denote that the issue was at the level that they worked. Um, but for parents and guardians, the issues and concerns that were raised to my office were specifically denoted at this level. Um, so as you can see here, of the 65 parents, 29 visitors or 45% had concerns at the middle school level, 16 or 25% had concerns at the elementary school level, 15 visitors or 23% were at the high school level, and then five visitors or 7% were raising concerns with um, central office level, which also included PWCS policies or regulations. So now I'm going to take a, a few minutes and talk about the type of concerns that have been raised to my office and some common themes that I have seen. As I mentioned, an ombudsman is not an investigator. Therefore, they will often rely upon the visitors to contact the office. And through these contacts, we're able to identify common themes within the data. And taking some time today to talk about these common themes that I found for both my parents and my community who have reached out, I do want to note that these concerns are not indicative of the entire PWCS as a whole, but based solely on the data of those who have reached out to myself. So first off, navigating PWCS processes effectively. This was a common concern that I heard from many parents and community members. Um, some of what that had to do with was the fact that visitors felt um, difficulty in understanding and navigating school processes, such as the disciplinary process, special education services, and the transfer process. The next concern uh, that I often heard is in regard to the school and parent relationship. And visitors would express their concerns that they were not adequately heard or being addressed in a timely manner by administrators. Another concern that I heard was in regard to English learner needs. Many visitors believe their assumptions were being made by staff that the parent or guardian fully understood a process or services when interpreters services were not specifically requested. 
And in regard to the special education process, this is a common concern that I heard from a number of parents and community members. And the challenges that they face in navigating the special education process due to the perception that there's insufficient support um, from administrators when addressing these matters. Another concern that I heard was consistency within PWCS. Many visitors spoke with me about their concerns regarding inconsistent procedural approach with their child schools and varied interpretations of the same procedures across PWCS. And then finally, the common concern that I heard was addressing of student behavior. Um, many visitors noted that Discipline issues across PWCS was um, not being handled in their mind effectively. Um, and there's a perception that there was a lack of accountability for students due to the persistence of these behaviors. And as I've explained so far, my role as an organizational ombudsman is not to mandate change, but to give feedback to the decision makers within PWCS for their awareness and evaluation. And in that case, in all of these scenarios, that's what I have done. So next I'd like to go through uh, a lot of common reasons I hear about why people don't consult the ombudsman's office. So first off uh, is I didn't know the office existed. So as I mentioned, this office is fairly new to PWCS. Again, that's why I am thankful for this opportunity to speak before you and any chance that I can. Um, the role is often misunderstood as I began. Um, if I was an AC repairman and your AC was out, you'd know who to call. Um, uh, so what I tell folks is if you've got a conflict, then I'm the person to call. Um, certainly there's other avenues in which you can address that, but if you'd like to, um, kind of think things through before committing to something, I'm a great place to start. The next one is, I don't know what the office does, and this is common, um, but there's many ways in which I can help. Um, some of what I do, especially for parents is provide referrals. Um, I do help uh, facilitate conversations between individuals. Um, I can participate in what I call shuttle diplomacy. Um, how that looks is at times I've had um, parents who have contacted me and they have concerns with their administrator and they're not sure how to approach them. Uh, certainly, I try to conflict coach individuals so I can empower them to address the situation because as I mentioned, I'm outside of this. I'm not within the school. I'm not within the daily um, dynamics of the school system. And so I do encourage people to address the matter themselves, but sometimes they don't feel comfortable in doing that. And if um, they would like for me to speak with the administrators about that, certainly that's something that I can provide as a shuttle diplomacy. Um, I do conduct training and um, on conflict management and conflict resolution skills. So another reason why often people don't consult the office is they think the issue for them is too small. And that because I am looking at the entire organization and um, they don't feel that this they want to waste my time. That's not the case at all. I am here to help any concern. Um, there is no small issue. There is no large issue. There is just conflict. So if I can help you, that's what I want to do. Some folks will say, well, it's been going on for years, or I've gone through the same principle and with one child and I had it with another child and it was the same concerns and nothing. You can't help me now. Um, I'm here to help you no matter wherever it began or how long it's been ongoing. Um, Obviously, there's different options that we can talk about, but reaching out is the first step to see if I can help. I should be able to solve this on my own. 
that's wonderful. And I hope that you can, but a lot of times it's tough. The organization here is very large and there's a lot of challenges in trying to find where it is to resolve your issue. So talking to me can help clarify what really is the issue and what the concern you have is, and then talking about what are those options. So ultimately you make the choice. So you are solving it for yourself. You're just talking to someone who is a resource for you in the hopes that you can get some ideas on different ways in which to move forward. People often say they don't believe the office is confidential. I do take that very seriously. That is a foundation of my office. It's why I highlighted as the first principle. Um, I am duty bound to be a confidential resource for you. Again, unless I feel that there's an imminent risk of harm to yourself or others, or if it's a mandating reporting issue, um, there will be nothing that I will share about your visit to the office, including of whether or not you came or not. That information is not maintained. So again, as I mentioned earlier, and you saw in the data, what I maintain is statistical data. I do not maintain records in regard to anyone who contacts my office. I don't want the way I've handled the situation to be second guessed or criticized. I'm not here to do that. I don't judge you. I don't second guess you. What I'm trying to do is help you navigate the situation that you're in. I know that conflict can bring a, a um, hard line to folks. Um, it can uh, be detrimental. Um, not just for the individuals, but for an organization. So I'm not here to do that. I'm here to help you get through it. English is not my first language, so I don't know if you can help me. This was a great one. Um, one of the reasons I chose to come to PWCS is because of the diversity that is here. Um, I have already worked with um, many individuals who English is not their first language. So I do have translation services available. I am more than happy to work with anyone in their native language. Once I call the ombudsman, the situation will be out of my control. You, know, you as the visitor get to decide how you move forward. Again, we talk things through, we weigh, what the different options are that I present. And again, as you go through, if you choose an option and that doesn't work for you, you're welcome to come back and talk to me and we can talk about some other things and other strategies. Talking to me once you call or come in and visit is not going to be letting it get out of control. You're deciding it. I don't want to be seen as a complainer. You're not. Contacting me again is not um, looking at it from the same vein of, excessively talking about it with no productive reason for moving forward. Again, um, you can talk openly about with me what your concerns are. As I mentioned, I'm not second guessing you. I'm not judging you. I'm just trying to help you move forward. Um, generally, my visits are uh, scheduled and we'll talk about that um, towards the end, how that looks like, but I generally schedule them for an hour. Um, we get through what we need to get through. If um, we need additional time. I'm more than happy to schedule another time with you or check back in with you if that's what you'd like me to do. Again, um, you're driving this. So don't feel like coming to my office would be a hindrance in the process. I don't want that to be. I want it to be a safe place for you to talk things through and to get the help that you need. Speaking about helpful resources, so what I'd like to do is kind of highlight some of those things that in my last two years here, um, I've noticed that parents and community um, as a whole um, would benefit from understanding um, these different resources. Again, these are some of the options that I do provide for folks um, based upon what I hear. And again, I'm not going to talk about specific cases, but I am going to talk about some of the things that are important for the organization and for you as individuals who may have conflict, um, avenues in which you can look into. Um, again, uh, any organization can be large and overwhelming for folks, and especially a uh, school system as large as this one. So I wanted to highlight a few of these. Um, so hopefully this will work as I go to it. And can you guys see this? Yep, 
Okay, great. Um, so one is the Parent Resource Center. So the Parent Resource Center is a, um, as it mentions, is a resource for you as parents. Um, this specifically deals with special education. Um, they have a lot of workshops and a lot of wealth of information. Um, I will say a lot of times I have parents who are new to the special education process. They don't understand the process. They don't understand um, anything, um, the different steps that are involved with that. So this is a great resource. Um, they do have a coordinator over that, and that is Eleanor Contreras. And so um, I would encourage folks to reach out to them. The next thing I'd like to point out is um, PWCS's policies and regulations. So as any organization generally does have the policies and regulations that run that organization and PWCS is no different. So um, a lot of times I have parents who reach out to me who are unaware of what a process is. Um, so this is a great way to uh, find out certain um, different processes within the organization. Again, these policies are uh, large and it can be confusing at times, and I understand that. So um, generally when I do speak with visitors, I try and help identify what the policy is for them and point them in that right direction. But this is another resource for you. Code of behavior. Um, I do get a lot of questions in regard to code of behavior. And um, again, this is something that is a key factor for this organization, specifically if a number of the concerns that I had were at the middle school level, a lot of that had to do with bullying. So that is behavior of their students. Um, so this is another resource that I do often point parents to. PWCS leadership. A lot of times we know the principal at our school, but we don't know the other leadership. And so I point this out to individuals because for all of the different um, schools, they do have an associate level superintendent who oversees that school. So we have three for the elementary schools, two for the middle schools and two for the high schools. So um, we also have associate superintendents over special education, student services and teacher and learning. But I do wanna highlight the associate superintendent level because that is something if a parent or community member feels that they are being unheard at their school, this is another avenue for them. And then lastly, the Prince William County School Board. Many people don't know who their school board representative is. Um, so these are the individuals that represent um, the school division. Um, we are having um, uh, three new school board members um, who are being sworn in this week who will take um, office in January. Um, so again, um, these individuals are, are your school board member and another uh, resource for you as well. Well, can we highlight the fact that um, your website is also on the school board uh, page towards the bottom? Yes, that it is. And I am happy to highlight that. Um, I will put on at the end about my um, page, but let me get to that here. So often, um, as with organizations, um, where you are found um, can be challenging for folks. Um, but my office is located under the school board leadership because I do report to the school board. So you'll see here, Office of the Ombudsman. And I'm going to go into that at the end, but that's where you can find me. You can also search for me in the search bar under Ombudsman or Ombuds that should be able to pull it up. Um, I am working with the school division to get a um, higher up placement so that folks can um, see me more readily. But for right now, that's where I am located. So I want to point out that, again, conflict's inevitable. Um, I would like to say that, uh, you know, as an ombudsman, I can eradicate all conflict. That's never going to be. Um, we're human and that's what happens. Um, but while an ombudsman cannot mandate change, um, they can help the individual to address their concerns by serving as that neutral sounding board. 
and identifying the options to address it. They can also help the organization by providing feedback, which focuses on improving the organization's overall health. And that's what I hope to do. I also hope to service that early warning system by raising concerns which may not have surfaced without such an avenue. As I highlighted that um, there's different areas here within this county, one of the key things for the Ombudsman's Office is the fact that people voluntarily come to see me. And what I see are people from all over the entire county. I don't just see pockets of people. I see everyone. And that gives me a different vantage point to be able to see if concerns are happening on one side of the county or are they also happening on the other side of the county? Are concerns happening across middle school levels? So I'm able to connect those dots. So that's why it is important for an organization to have an ombudsman to be that confidential, neutral sounding resource for folks. So I wanna thank everyone again for joining me here today. I do wanna talk a little bit about, <clears throat> excuse me, my website and um, where you can find information. I have put on here QR code, you're welcome to scan that um, and that will take you to my website. Um, so going into it again here, if we look at this, um, I will point out so you can see um, on here is some additional information. Um, I do want to highlight uh, that we do have a new online booking system for um, individuals contacting my office. To do that, um, you can just click here to schedule an appointment. It will then take you to my specific site, which allows you to pick what type of meeting you'd like, either in person, Zoom, or a phone call. Um, we'll just say you selected Zoom, that then pops up a calendar, which provides you with the dates that I'm available. You click on whatever date works for you. You can then see a series of times. You pick the time that works for you. You'll get an email notification with that. If you need to change that, you're more than welcome to. Um, I do want to note for you, so um, there is a time, as you can see here, a start time at 8.30, end time at 4. Um, I am cognizant of the fact that I have people who have a variety of types of hours. So if you look at my schedule and you say, well, oh, gosh, I, I really wish you could talk at 7 o'clock. I can talk at 7 o'clock a.m. or p.m. I am here as a resource for you, so I will work with you. I've put this down, but if you need um, to meet with me um, at an off time, more than happy to do that. So what I would say for that is if you've looked at my schedule and you can't find a time that works for you, please either email me or call me and I can um, identify a time and more than happy to. Um, I also want to note here is that I am located at the Independent Hill Complex. That is not the Kelly Leadership Building. I am not located there. I am at an offsite from that. Again, that's in part due to the confidentiality nature of the office. So um, the, in, the information is there as well as the directions. But if you do schedule an in-person meeting, you get that information as well. Um, there's also, as you see, some other information in here about how I can help, how I operate, similar to what I've talked about today, but this is a resource for you to go to. Um, the reports that I've had, um, the ones I've done for the last two years, as well as the prior reports are all there if you're interested in looking at that information. Um, but again, if you ever have any questions or concerns, I encourage you to reach out to me. Um, I'm more than happy to help. and. It, if I'm just a starting place or I'm one in which there's more engagement with me, whatever it is, I'm here for you. So again, I thank you for the time and I appreciate your continued support. I'm happy to take any questions. I know we have about uh, eight minutes left or so. I want to be cognizant of your time. I again, appreciate, I know you have busy schedules and the fact that you came on tonight um, speaks volumes to your um, wanting to understand what the role is. So I hope I've helped with that. If you have any questions, please go ahead and type them in the chat and we'll have uh, Ms. Uh, Bookstein go ahead and uh, respond.
Yes, um, I will be sending a follow up email tomorrow to everyone that registered, including those that were not able to attend. I'll go ahead and um, attach uh, her PowerPoint as well as uh, the video recording of today's session. We have any other questions? At this time, I would just like to say um, thank you to everyone that joined us. Uh, this was a very informative session. Thank you to Ms. Buckstein as well. Um, we have put a survey link in the chat box. Please take the time to fill out that survey. We always welcome any feedback on uh, this session and then any future sessions you may be interested in. Um, Again, I will be sending a follow-up email with resources to include the PowerPoint presentation for today, as well as the video recording. And so thank you all so much. And if we don't have any questions, I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you again. Thank you.